Hello students, welcome to MEC 1321 Engineering Statics. My name is Dr. Stewart and today we're going to go ahead and start Chapter 6. Uh, chapter 6 is one of the key and critical chapters in statics. Uh, it's, a stactor, it's a chapter where we really learn some of the key concepts in structural analysis. And how do we take multi-body uh, uh, geometries or multi-body objects and actually determine the forces that they develop in the connection between those members. Uh, the objective that we have here for Chapter 6 is to show how to determine the forces in the members of a truss using the method of joints and the method of sections, uh, to analyze the forces acting on members of frames and machines composed of pin-connected members. Now, in general, structural analysis Performing an adequate structural analysis is very important for most basic designs. Uh, a particular good example or a good way to, to look at when you perform a bad structural analysis is to do a Wikipedia search on bridge failures. Often, many of the failures could have been avoided by doing a more thorough structural analysis and including things such as safety factors uh, and accounting for some of the basic shifts and changes that occur in loading conditions. Um, so today we're going to go over 6.1 and 6.2 from the book. Section 6.1 is simple trusses and section 6.2 is the method of joints. So these are the two things that we're going to go over. So let's go ahead and go into simple trusses. What are trusses? We see trusses in our daily lives. We see them in bridges. We see them sometimes in roofing structures. Um, we see them in a number of different locations, um, but how do we identify what a truss is and what is a truss? Uh, what is it really? A truss is a structure composed of slender members joined together at their endpoints. Um, so the, the singular or the most basic unit of a truss is a single member, uh, a rigid member that either has a tension applied to it or a compression applied to it. So if we look at the diagram here, a member in tension has the forces, force vectors coming out of it. And if that member was separated from its pin connection, then if we looked at and isolated the pin connection, we would see that the force is coming out of the pin connection, right? So think about if you have a pencil in your hand and you're pulling that pencil apart. You're imparting a tension in that pencil. Now if you were to have the pencil fixed at one end by a pin and you were pulling on the other end, then the force that you feel tugging at the hand that simulates a pin is going to indicate the direction of the tensile force in the pin when the pin is isolated. And thus, that's why when we have a tensile, uh, a member under tension, that the forces come out of it as well as the forces coming out of the pin. And if we have a member under compression, the forces go into the member and the force goes into the pin that uh, is attached to that member. Now it's important to remember with these single members uh, for trusses that the force in them on both ends of the member or within the member in general is equal, um, it's opposite, and it also has the same line of action. So now let's go ahead and look at an example of a truss, which is a roof truss. Um, so think about a roof, uh, you know, if you've seen the framing inside of roofs, certain types of roofs, you'll see a truss system. Um, and the example here is a purlin uh, uh, series of truss, uh, a series of purlins that connect these truss assemblies. Now, if we were to take this 3D uh, truss and describe it as a 2D system, uh, and just to take the first row of trusses in this system, and we were to uh, identify the loads that develop in the truss, we'll find certain assumptions can be made. One of the assumptions is that all the loads are applied at the joints. And another assumption that we use with trusses is that the members are joined together by smooth pins, right? And so these pins do not allow uh, rotation uh, to occur. So, uh, what is a simple truss? A simple truss uh, is a system that consists of three members that are pin-connected at their ends 
uh, and such that they form a triangular truss that will be rigid, right? So three members pin connected at their ends are, are the smallest and the simplest unit of a truss. And we can form more complex trusses by adding additional, two additional members to that original simple truss. So if we look at the diagram here, we have our initial simple truss, which is outlined in black. And then we can add additional members or, or, or extend the truss system by just adding two members. So we add two members here, two members there, two members here, two members there in order to form a series of triangles. And as we do that, we're developing more complex truss systems. Um, so now let's go ahead and go into the method of joints. And this is something that uh, you might remember from earlier in the book. Um, the method of joints. In order to analyze or design a truss, it is necessary to determine the force in each of its members, right? So if you have a truss system of uh, 11 members, it's important in order to analyze and really validate the, the, structure, the structure of that truss to understand the forces that go through each and every one of those members. And in order to do that, one of the ways that we can do that is to use the method of joints. Well, the method of joints states that if the tire truss is in equilibrium, then each joint is also in equilibrium. So if you have an entire truss system, and we can state that it's in equilibrium, every single connecting point within that truss is going to have an equilibrium state, right? Uh, so as a result, the sum of the forces in the X and the sum of forces of the Y at every single joint, every single point of interest is going to be equal to zero. Um, and this is perhaps similar to uh, some of the uh, examples that you do that, that were done in chapter three, where you see an assembly of cables. So you have a, a multi-cable system. And sometimes you have to create more than one free body diagram in order to find all the unknowns in that multi-cable system. Um, that is using the method of joints. Um, that is a method of joints where we're looking at the individual joints. And when we do that, when we did that in chapter three, we found that equilibrium, we used equilibrium uh, in, in both of the free body diagrams. Because if the entire body or the entire system is supposed to be in equilibrium, then you can separate it by joints and use the method of joints, okay? So the sense, it's important to try to figure out what is the sense of the unknown forces, the forces that go through the joints. Uh, the correct sense of an unknown force can be determined by inspection, where the sum of the forces in the X and Y must equal to zero. So often, when you are given a problem, you're given a certain number of knowns, and then there are a number of unknown forces that develop in the members. If you start at the location where you have your knowns, and through uh, inspection, you should be able to identify uh, the basic directions of those unknown reaction forces in comparison to the known forces that you're gonna be given. Um, however, uh, it's to be safe, uh, it's, it's acceptable to always assume that unknown forces that are acting at a joint are acting in tension, right? So if inspection method fails you or you're not comfortable with using inspection, then you can simply assume that every unknown force is in tension. And when you do that, you can go ahead and, and you can do that. And then when you apply your equations of equilibrium, and you solve for the values of those unknowns, if you get a positive solution, then that means that you were correct. It's intention. But if you get a negative solution, then that means that you were incorrect. The, the, the initial assumption that you made was incorrect. And that means that it's actually in compression. And it's important when you solve problems to identify um, both the magnitude of the, of the force that develops in the member, but also if it's intention or compression. Where after, the value you put T for tension or C for compression. Uh, and we're gonna be looking for that for problems on your, on your exams um, to make sure that you've correctly identified not only the magnitude but also the sense of those forces. Um, and in class we'll go over examples of how to use the inspection method and also we'll show what happens when you decide not to use the inspection method where you look at your knowns and 
uh, and identify your unknown senses. Uh, and when you, and instead of doing that method, simply assume tension. We will we'll show examples of, of both of those. So, um, so now let's go ahead and go in. What is the procedure for actually applying the method of joints? And I'm a little bit sorry for the blurriness of this image. I took it with my uh, tablet, so I don't have very high uh, megapixel count here. So let's go ahead and go into the method. Uh, the method should start like any other method when we're trying to solve a problem. We identify our knowns and our unknowns. We draw a free body diagram uh, of the joint uh, of, of the of the joint that has at least one known force and at the most two unknown forces, right? So uh, if we're going to have a joint, it's a 2D problem, we need to have that joint have at least one known and at the max two unknowns because we're only going to be able to get those two force equations, right? Um, if this joint is at one of the supports, then it may be necessary to first calculate external reactions at the supports. Okay. Uh, the next step is use one of the two methods described. Uh, well, yeah, use one of the two methods above described to establish your sense. So either use inspection, so using the sum of the forces and that given uh, known that you have in order to determine the sense of your two unknowns, or to simply assume that you have tension uh, in those unknowns. The next thing is to establish your x, y axes and coordinate system and then go ahead and apply those equilibrium equations. Uh, because you have at the max two unknowns and you have two equations of equilibrium, you can solve for those using algebraic manipulation and you can simply calculate your result. Now if you uh, have analyzed your problem and you apply the sense through inspection, then you'll know what the appropriate, you, you'll have select the appropriate sense. However, if you decide to assume that the unknowns are intention, then if, it's, if the unknown is intention, the magnitude is positive. If the unknown is, if the, if the, if the magnitude has a negative, well, if the, the solution has a negative value, then it's in compression. So remember, harking back to the other page, um, if you assume tension initially, then your final solution needs to be positive. Otherwise, you assume the wrong sense and you need to make sure that you identify that no, this member is in compression. So the, the, one of the most key concepts is a joint must have at least uh, one known and at the most two unknowns. Uh, and this heart really harkens back to the number of unknowns being equal, less than or equal to the number of, of, uh, of equations that you have in a problem, right? So it's very important for you to, to be mindful of this concept and when you start drawing your free body diagrams, because uh, you're going to draw the first one where your, where your one unknown is, I mean where your one known is and, and, your other and your two unknowns are, and then as you go and you find those unknowns, you'll be able to create free body diagrams for the additional joints and find the force in all of the different members. So another super key concept is just the basic concept of what arrow, what direction of your arrow indicates tension. So say we have, again, uh, a pin, well, uh, uh, a rod, it's connected by a pin, and we're putting tension into it, we're pulling on it. Well, then when we separate that member, uh, if we were to separate it into a member and then the pin connection and identify the forces in each of those, we'd find that we have an equal and opposite force that has the same line of action in the member, and we have a force um, that if we were to combine the member and the pin together, we would produce the original tension, right? So if we were to take these two members together, and we were to cross these two parts out and then move the member back onto the pin, we'll find that all we have is this tension that's applied at the end of the member, right? So it's important to know tension is pulling apart and compression is squeezing, right? And it's important to remember the way that the pin connection uh, uh, connects with the actual force that goes through the member. So this is pretty much uh, the example, well this is pretty much the, the material for section 6.1 and 6.2. Um, the method of joints is a good method However, it is, very, it is a very time-intensive method. And later, we'll learn the method of sections, which is a more appropriate uh, method for determining uh, ra very rapidly 
the forces that go through members, right? So while you can use the method of joints or the method of sections, on your exams, it's preferred that you use the method of sections because the method of joints is very, very, very time consuming. Um, so with that said, please read uh, section 6.1 and 6.2 from the book. These sections are just a few pages um, and they uh, cover a lot of the details that I don't have in this video. Um, make sure that you prepare for your quiz and um, uh, I, I guess I'll see you guys in class. All right, thank you. I'm Dr. Stewart.